So I guess we can get started. Um, my name is Jukka Chitting. Um, I'm I've been working on Apache projects for for quite a while now, about ten years. Um, and uh, a few years ago, I was was more deeply involved in in, in getting Git uh, introduced into into Apache. Uh, nowadays, I'm I'm just a happy user. Uh, I, I don't really um, I'm not really involved in the latest developments. So, so kind of if you're interested in, for example, what, what the new pull request stuff does, uh, it, it's better to ask uh, the info people who are, who are nowadays working on them. I'll just may briefly mention them, what they do, uh, but I'm, I'm not that familiar with the imp implementation details at the moment. But uh, what I wanted to talk to, talk to you about uh, today uh, and in this presentation is, is just give you a, kind of a case study of, of how uh, we've been using uh, GitHub and Travis uh, CI within, mostly within the Apache Jackrabbit project. Um, but I kind of use the same tooling also, also for other stuff that I, that I do within Apache. Uh, and for me, it works pretty well. Uh, some of you might already use some of these tools or use something else that might be better or might, might work a little bit differently. Um, I'm not saying that this is the right thing to do or the best thing to do, just kind of giving you some ideas on, on what you can do and, and how it works in practice. So um, with that intro, uh, we're gonna go through GitHub and Travis CI. I assume all of you are already uh, familiar with GitHub. Is there anyone who doesn't know what GitHub is? Right. So, um, GitHub itself says that it's the best place to share code with, with different people. Um, it's pretty good. Um, I like to think of it as, as the source ports of, of this decade. Uh, probably next decade we'll have something different again. Uh, but today it's, it's the place to be uh, for, for, for most uh, open source development. And it's nice that also Apache software is, is there available and you can use the functionality that, that's provided by GitHub to, to do also Apache development. Another thing I'm gonna talk about is, is Travis CI. It's, it's kind of a new style uh, continuous integration system. It's kind of born out of, out of uh, cloud technology and being made possible by GitHub. Um, it's a pretty neat system and it works pretty well. Um, of course, there are different CI systems for, for projects within, within Apache, um, uh, but this is kind of, it's nice always to have alternatives. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how Travis works and how you can use it uh, for, for Apache project, projects, excuse me. And, um, and of course, we'll be talking about the Apache Software Foundation um, and how um, the specific uh, practices within Apache affect the ways in which you can use such external services and affect the ways how your community should, should react to such tools. Uh, some things to keep in mind um, um, when, when doing stuff like this. So uh, generally about these external services, I hear from a lot of people, or at least the, uh, a couple of years ago, I heard from a lot of people that know you shouldn't be using these services, that they break up your community. Uh, it, it, it'll, it'll ruin, ruin uh, the project. Uh, but actually we've been using these kinds of external services all the time, uh, as long as Apache has existed. Uh, they come and they go, uh, new ones uh, are born every year. Uh, some are useful, some aren't that useful. Uh, just a couple of examples for, for browsing and searching code. Uh, Apache has some tooling uh, uh, in, in our own infra, uh, but it's not really as, as fully features as stuff like SVN search or, or the FISI uh, instance that, that, that Atassian uh, hosts. Uh, for mailing list archives, Apache has, has uh, the canonical archives that you'll wanna point to if you have, want to have a link that, that, that for sure will remain valid for the next 10 years, uh, and you want to use uh, the one that that's the Software Foundation provides. But if you're just searching around and trying to find something for, for, for immediate use, uh, 
some of the other mailing list archives provide a lot, lot more intuitive uh, and, and more useful uh, interfaces for doing that. Um, and there are a lot of like, like communication tools um, that go over and beyond the mailing lists uh, and other tools that, that the ASF provides. They're useful for, for, for many purposes, but again, you just shouldn't use them as the only uh, location. You want to have a record of what happens in the project within the mailing lists uh, and within the tools that the, the foundation uh, maintains, because with the foundation, we have longevity uh, for the project. Uh, it's, it's something like you want to try to plan for at least the next 10 years, next 20 years for a project. And then these kinds of external services, where they're useful today, they might not be around uh, five or 10 years from now. So that, that's something to keep in mind. And also, uh, all these platforms, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Stack Overflow, Olo, they're very useful, uh, very nice, and then you get a lot of value for your project by, by being there and, and using these tools and services. Um, again, just keep in mind that, okay, they might go away at some point in time. And, and, and that's why you want to keep uh, the important parts um, within the foundation. So uh, to summarize, these are useful services they add on top of the stuff that, that's already provided, the kind of um, amend, extend uh, stuff that you can use. And the nice thing is that they're, they're, most of them, they're, they're completely free for anyone to use. Uh, the most you pay is that, that you get tracked and you get advertised to and all that stuff, but that's a reasonable price to pay for the benefit you get out of these services. So um, I think the, one of the, the key guidelines that I myself use uh, when using such services is like just to make sure that, that when someone asks in the project, why was this done? Why was something done? You want to be able to have a URL that points back to some resource that's hosted by the ASF. So then like 10 years later, when you go back to that question, you want to find the reason why we did something like this. You'll be able to find it and it won't, won't have uh, gone away when a company crashed or something like that. <clears throat> but as long as that guideline is served, uh, these are really nice tools to use. So with that background, uh, let's, let's take a look at, at, at GitHub first uh, on how I'm using it uh, and how some of the projects are using it. And this, again, is not, not the only way you could use, use GitHub for Apache stuff. Um, first, generally about the Git uh, resources that are available for Apache projects. If your project's one, pro project wants, um, you can start using Git uh, as the canonical repository. <clears throat> Just ask Infra to create, create you uh, a new Git repository and then that'll be done. Um, if you're not ready to do that or you, don't, you want to stay with subversion, um, but some people within your community want to use Git. Uh, you can have a read-only mirror that mirrors every change that goes into SVN into a Git repository. And then those people who want to use that, uh, that's actually the model that I'm using. Uh, they can clone uh, the Git repository, and then with a little bit of extra, extra tweaking, they can then also commit back to SVN through that Git clone. And that works pretty well. Um, both of these types of repositories, both the writable repositories and the read-only ones, are mirrored on GitHub, which allows us to use uh, all the functionality that, uh, that's available at GitHub, in addition to the core bits that, that uh, the ASF uh, provides. One of the most important bits that the ASF does provide that's not available from GitHub is uh, a, a kind of um, an audit trail of who changed what. Uh, it is a little bit tricky system in that, that you can, unless you, you cryptographically sign your commits, there's no way for someone later on to tell that, okay, it was actually you who did this commit. Because someone else could, could just, just set their settings to rewrite their name and then rewrite their email address and make commits that would look as if they came from you and then post them to the repository and 
that's what happened. And that's what the, the ASF provides, and that's why it's important that we keep the repositories, the canonical source of the repositories will stay within the ASF instead of on GitHub. So you have the audit trail. But then uh, I, I mentioned that, that kind of for a project that's still using subversion, if there are people who want to use Git uh, to use this project, it's also possible to go the other way around. If you have a project that has opted to use Git, but there are people who want to, to use subversion to develop, um, that's also possible. You can check out uh, a repository from GitHub with subversion, and then you have a get subversion checkout of your repository. Unfortunately, it doesn't support commit uh, since we only have read-only mirrors there, but you can still kind of use, use uh, your SVN tooling uh, to access also, also Git projects. This is what uh, the ASF's presence on GitHub currently looks like. There's an ASF or Apache organization uh, that contains all of the, the, the repositories uh, that we have. Um, there are quite a few of them. Uh, if you want to find something, you, you'll want to use the search instead of browsing through all of them. Don't remember how many there are exactly, but it's hundreds and hundreds. Um, there's a way, just a recently added way to, to, to kind of affiliate yourself with, with that organization. It doesn't give you any, any extra permissions. You can't push directly to GitHub or anything, but you can have your, your, your face shown up as part of the Apache organization. That's nice. It's currently av available only to committers. So. You'll find uh, the instructions on, on what to do uh, in this, this file within the private committers repository. Uh, then um, specific projects look like this. Uh, this is the one that I'm currently working most actively. Uh, it's a sub-project of, of Jackrabbit uh, that we have a separate repository for. Um, and it it's, it's just looks like a normal GitHub project. Um, I have my own fork uh, of the project, but it's real basically like for private use. I don't, uh, like I don't accept pull, re pull requests on that fork, specifically for the reason that I don't want to kind of the record of what happens in the project be spread across uh, external resources. All the kind of pull requests need to come through the issue tracker or through the, the, the ASF mirror. Um, or, or the Apache organization within, within GitHub. Um, I think someone tried to, to send a pull request on one of my forks. I just closed it and told it, okay, send that, that code change to somewhere else. Um, and as you can see, I'm not using this uh, for very frequently. The last time I pushed something uh, to the trunk of that repository was, was quite a while ago. But instead, what I use it for I have these, these feature branches that I create locally uh, when I want to wor work on a specific issue. So here I have uh, specific issue numbers that I use for, for the branches, like uh, Oak 763 or Oak 1672. That's specifically for that issue, fixing that bug or adding that feature. And the reason why I do this uh, and the reason why I push them to this fork is that I use it to sync. I'm using one computer uh, at the office and another at home, and then I have my laptop, um, and I'm kind of syncing those all together on some code that that's kind of that I consider still not ready to be committed. Um, it doesn't compile. It, it breaks the bill. It's something uh, that that's not not ready yet. Uh, it's very easy to do it with Git. Uh, you could do it with Subversion as well by doing, doing a branch, uh, but that's, at least in my experience, it's a lot more, uh, a lot more effort uh, and the tooling isn't, isn't that great there. So, so this is a very easy way to kind of, I just push my chases when I'm done uh, at the end of the day, and then if, if I want to take a look at it uh, on my laptop later on, I'll just pull that change set uh, from my fork. Another uh, nice feature about this, uh, let me see if I can jump out. Oh no, actually I don't have network now. So a nice feature of this is that I can go to these individual commits um, 
And, and GitHub has, has this feature, if you, if you navigate to a specific commit, you have the GitHub URL for the commit. If you append dot .patch at the end of it, it'll give you a text format patch uh, that you can then point to, to, to an issue tracker. Okay, here's my patch, uh, I can attach it or just, just send a link to it. And others who, who aren't using it and, and don't wanna pull those changes from GitHub will I be able to download the changes in a normal patch format. That's something that I use quite often, actually. It's uh, to be able to, to work with people who aren't using it. So kind of exchange patches uh, with those people. I can just point them to GitHub and they get a normal text format patch that they can apply, like do an Eclipse apply patch, even on a subversion uh, checkout. And that, that works very nicely. Uh, in some cases, uh, when I work with people who are also using the same mechanism, we just kind of like, okay, I have these changes in, in, in my branch there, and they could pull it, pull it back. But what we do there is, is kind of we try to make that communication happen in the issue tracker or on the mailing list. Uh, and ideally with, with links to the patches themselves instead of just the, the chain sets uh, on the Git interface. So that kind of others who are, who are following that discussion can, can refer and then see what, what's going on. And ultimately those changes will go back into subversion where they'll, they'll then have like a permanent home and a permanent URL for those changes. And that's an area where you have to be a little bit careful that, that because it's very easy to get into a mode where, okay, now I have this small team of people who are using Git to kind of send patches back and forth and start to evolve a branch. And then suddenly two weeks has gone and you have uh, 20 uh, commits there and then, oh, we should merge it back to, to trunk. Um, and then you push it back, and then you have a huge list of changes that no one else is aware of, and why did you do this? Um, so that, that, that's something to keep in mind when you're working uh, like this. But as long as you do that, it's, it's, it's a very useful tool, tool to use. Here's how I'm uh, setting this up in practice. So. Uh, these instructions, except for the fork part, are all on the, the, the wiki page. You can go to, to git apache org and follow the link to, to the wiki, and you'll find these, these same instructions. But just to walk you through, um, I'm actually cloning stuff from uh, GitHub instead of Apache. It's, I just find it more convenient. <laughs> it's the same content in both cases. Um, this, the benefit of doing this, or basically the reason why I'm doing this, is that it works really well with the GitHub uh, graphical user interfaces, since they kind of expect that the repositories you're working on from are coming from GitHub, and then they add all sorts of extra links to your commits and stuff like that. You can go back to the web interface and do searches and stuff. Um, it doesn't work that, that smoothly if the URLs point to something, somewhere else. But the source code is the same, and the commits are the same, so it doesn't make that much a difference. So the next step, uh, I go to the clone repository. I add a pointer to my uh, own fork. I've done it on, on the web interface, just click on fork. Um, and this kind of gives me then the ability to push these feature branches to that fork uh, whenever I want. And then uh, the next step is to do, kind of connect that clone to SVN so that I can la later do an SVN decommit um, to, to kind of commit my changes uh, back to SVN without leaving my Git, Git tooling. Um, and that's basically the, the set of commands to use. The first, the SVN init. This uh, dash uh, s uh, argument tells that, okay, it's a standard uh, repository structure. There's a trunk, there's branches, there's tags. If you have a different structure, some projects do, uh, then you can explicitly tell like, okay, given this base URL, where is the trunk or master branch? Uh, and where are the other branches and where are the tags? Uh, you can configure it uh, uh, for, for each, each need specifically. And then the git SVN rebase basically goes through uh, all the commit information that's already there uh, from the mirroring 
um, and kind of reconnect uh, the, the required uh, Git SVM metadata so that you can then later efficiently do, do a commit against uh, SVM. Um, another thing, thing that you need to do, uh, this is something that you need to do just once per computer. Uh, when you start using this, you just set uh, your username and, and email um, to whatever you want to be uh, shown in the Git commits. When you do a Git SVN uh, decommit, it will, in any case, rewrite those, that information. So it's not that important for that use case, but it makes uh, some things easier. And uh, to make the decommit work, work nicely, you'll want to have an up-to-date uh, like mapping of from um, the SVN user IDs uh, to these kinds of full name, email address pairs that, that Git is, is using. Um, or, or kind of that the mirrors that we have are using. And to do that, uh, the file here is updated automatically. You download it and then you point your Git installation that, okay, to find that mapping, go to this file. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, after that, you can do uh, uh, SVN development with, with Git. Uh, uh, there's a couple of other things that, that I could show you about that, um, but let's move on uh, for now. If you have time at the end, I could kind of go through, through those bits in, in a little bit more detail. So, um, oh yeah, before I move on to, to Travis and, and forget about it, there's a fairly new, new feature uh, that, that integrates the pull requests on GitHub better to Apache Infra. Uh, earlier on, they kind of work, but there were some missing features and it was a little bit tedious. So we currently haven't used pull request that much. Uh, just kind of uh, instructed people that, okay, if you want us to pull something, you can have it on GitHub, but make an issue in the issue tracker and, uh, and, and, and at least give us a link that, okay, here are the changes that I want to be made. Or better yet, add a patch. Um, but nowadays, uh, uh, Infra has uh, added a feature that, that integrates GitHub pull request better to, to, to Apache uh, infrastructure. Uh, so if you opt in, you can tell Infra that I, I want to start using this feature. It requires a little bit of configuration in your uh, Git mirror. Um, but once it's done, uh, basically whenever a pull request is made, um, it automatically creates an issue in your issue tracker. And whenever there are comments, uh, either uh, on the mailing list or the issue tracker or in the pull request, they get synced back and forth. So that's pretty neat uh, and it works pretty well. Um, uh, it, it's definitely something that I want to try out at some point. So far, I haven't gotten around to it. There, there's a recent blog post in the, in the infra blog so if you're interested in that, uh, go check that out. And there's instructions on, on, on what you can do. Okay, so uh, Travis, we used to use uh, Jenkins builds uh, within the ASF uh, Jenkins instance. Um, I was involved in, in, in administering that for a couple of years, uh, but then I just kind of got tired of, of the huge amount of work it requires just to keep it up and running smoothly. Um, and, and we started looking for alternatives. Uh, there's BuildBot that we are actually currently using for the Oak project um, as an alternative build system to Travis. And uh, it works pretty well, um, but the options of, of kind of what kinds of environments you can have there are, are a, bit, a little bit limited still. Um, <laughs> So, um, so that also wasn't ideal for us. Uh, so I'd been using Travis for, for, for another non-Apache project, and I figured that, okay, like it, it might be use, useful to try using it also for, for, for Jackrabbit and Oak. Um, and that, that's what we did. Um, I guess there are a couple currently, a couple of other uh, Apache projects I've seen in for request to kind of enable that. Um, that, that do this, but it's not very, very common at the moment. Uh, so, so I'll just walk you through like 
how to set it up and what you can expect with, from, from the Travis build. Uh, so basically, uh, Travis is this kind of cloud-based uh, CI system. Uh, instead of having a dedicated set of slaves where, where the builds are running, um, it, it actually uses virtual machines that are started up uh, separately over and over again for each build that is being run. So that guarantees that the build environments are very, uh, very stable. Like you always get a fresh new machine when you start a build. Um, so it's like there's there's no need to worry about like other other builds breaking things or 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 the system running out of out of space or out of memory because of other concurrent builds going on and so on. So it's a very kind of uh, simple and standardized uh, environment. And uh, to set it up, uh, you need a simple configuration file. I'll show you one in a moment. Um, and uh, you need a, a webhook uh, in the GitHub mirror um, of, your, of your repository. And that webhook will tell Travis, uh, it will notify Travis whenever there's something changing in the repository. Either there's a new commit that's being pushed from by, by the mirroring mechanism, or there's a pull request that was made. Um, and, and when that happens, uh, Travis will, will notice that, okay, now I have these new commits. I'll start builds on all of the commits that happened, even if, 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 if a number of commits were pushed, like I, I make a fast sequence of 10 commits, and there's no way the CI build could, could keep up with all of them, it'll still start a separate commit, uh, separate build for each of those commits, um, which is quite useful if kind of, it gives you a very good idea of where something failed and where something was fixed. Um, and, um, and basically, uh, for each of those builds, it goes to the cloud, starts a new uh, virtual machine based on whatever configuration you have. Uh, then it runs a number of, of setup tasks. You can basically write a script that downloads your dependencies, uh, starts a database, uploads test content, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then it runs the main build uh, that you've configured. Um, and that, again, can be pretty much anything. Uh, and at the end, uh, it records what happened. Uh, it takes a full log um, uh, of, of basically the system out of, of your build script um, and, and records what, what the exit value of the script was. Uh, and based on that, it tells like whether the build failed or, or succeeded. And that, that, that information is, is then stored and can be accessed there later on. You can configure Travis to send different types of notifications. You can notify IRC, you can send tweets, uh, you can send email, you can do all sorts of stuff um, to notify that, okay, now the build failed. Um, and as I mentioned, a very nice feature of this is that, that if you add a pull request, it will also build and test that pull request. So you don't actually have to download the sources and, and install the patch and build the source you, yourself uh, to see whether it works. It'll, you'll already likely by the time you see the patch uh, in, in the issue tracker, uh, you'll already have a, Git, uh, a Travis uh, notification that, okay, this actually worked. And that's, that's really neat. Um, some Apache projects did that with Jenkins as well. Uh, I think it was Hadoop or was it uh, River that did that? And that was pretty neat, but the system was really complicated. With Travis, we get that, get that essentially for free. Um, there are a couple of limitations. Um, it's a free to use system. Uh, they charge for, for, for commercial use. It's basically a, a German company that, 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 that's backing up uh, the Travis system. But they make it uh, free to use for any project, open source projects that, that's hosted on GitHub. Um, and basically what you get there is, is 50 minutes of, of build time per each commit that you make. Uh, which is pretty nice uh, that you can do a lot of testing in that time. Um, unfortunately, we currently do run into that limit uh, because it's so easy to do a lot of different configurations with Travis. Um, so what you can do is kind of if you do run into that, that limit, you can split your build into different uh, configurations. Basically do a matrix build 
and then kind of, okay, I want to run this uh, test set of tests against that database or against that other database uh, or in this environment or in that other environment. Um, and that's, that's very easy to configure, um, but since this is a free, free to use system, you'll want to be a little bit considerate that, that kind of you don't overload the, or at least like use a unreasonable amount of resources. So um, another, basically probably the, the biggest limitation with Travis is, is, which is understandable, they limit the amount of network traffic that you can do. You can't use it to, to send a lot of spam all over the world or try hacking, hacking websites or, or record the, the memory contents of, 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 of various websites. Uh, they have a pretty strict set of rules of what, what is accessible uh, from within those virtual machines. Uh, what you can do uh, is, is, for example, get Maven dependencies. Um, if you have a Node.js project, you can use NPM to download packages. Um, you can install uh, standard software, for example. Um, you can use apt-get uh, to install uh, different types of software that, that's available in the standard distributions that's not included in the normal um, normal virtual machines uh, or the base machines that are available. So you can do pretty much uh, within those bounds. But of course, like if you have, for example, want to, to use this system to do like live checks of, of, of some random website, then that's not gonna work. Or if you want to use it to hack something, then, then it, it's not gonna work. Uh, even more limited are the options of sending stuff out of the system. Uh, so you can download stuff fairly freely, but for example, if you want to use this system for, for deploying snapshots to, to, uh, to a repository for other people to use, then that's a little bit tricky. Um, and it currently doesn't work for, for Maven. Uh, you can do, there's a couple of supported uh, deployment options where you can, for example, if you have a Heroku uh, application uh, that, that's, that's running on the Heroku cloud, then you could kind of on a successful build uh, have your latest state deployed there uh, automatically from Travis. Uh, and some of the other, other cloud hosting uh, environments do provide that, that feature. But uh, generically, like, like pushing releases out or pushing snapshots out from the system is not gonna work. So that's, that's a drawback um, to it. Another thing that, that's a little bit unfortunate um, is that the email notifications don't work too well with the Apache mailing lists. Um, that's basically because they use variable uh, return paths on the emails that they send so that they, they can know like when, when a specific email uh, starts bouncing or, or is not, not just successful. Uh, they can tell uh, what, what actually happened uh, quite easily. Um, and the way we would kind of fix that for now is that I actually run uh, a simple script on, on an external server that, that, that I host myself and have Travis send uh, web notifications to that script that then translates those into emails that they then get sent to, to our mailing list, which is, it works, but it's not very clean. Um, if, if this becomes more widely used within the ASF, I would figure that that we'd work a way, uh, work out a way to do that with, with, with Travis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that, that might work, yeah. Get, Travis can send a comment, for example, to a pull request I suppose it can also comment on, on a commit to tell that, okay, this commit passed or failed a build. Um, I haven't used those features myself, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but, but I recall seeing that, that in use in some projects. So that might work already now. Yeah. So um, I'll show you a simple configuration file that we currently use. Uh, it shows a little bit about the notifications. There's a whole lot of different ways of, of configuring this. So I'll just walk through the basic configuration. 
So um, the basic part here uh, where everything starts is you tell like what is the domain language that, that your software is using. And that then uh, selects uh, uh, which virtual machines you're going to be getting. Uh, other uh, stuff that configures like which, which environments you're getting. For example, for, for Java, you can spell it, select that, okay, I want to run it on, on this, this JDK. Currently, it supports uh, Oracle's Java 6 and Java 7. Uh, there's Open JDK uh, 7. Um, and then there's the, the Java 8 early access, so they don't yet have the, the official one, but I suppose it will come soon. They support a huge number of different languages, pro ranging from Ruby to Haskell to, to Clojure to you name it, C, uh, PHP, whatever. Um, I guess the, the list of languages that they don't support is, is smaller <laughs> than what they do support. And the system is, is uh, all open, uh, so you can get the, the, get the source code from GitHub. Um, you can see how it works. You can actually send them new virtual machines that implement a certain, can, or come with a certain new language if you want. So if you figure out that, okay, I want to do some, some Prolog programming with Travis, I don't think they support Prolog at the moment, you could come up with a virtual machine that, that comes with Prolog, uh, and then send a pull request that, okay, I want this feature added. You can. Uh, they do support different types of operating systems. I'm not sure exactly what operating systems there are available, but you can configure it. You'll need to check, check it up. There's a whole list of, of the options there. Um, but for, for us, we've so far only wanted to use a single build. We didn't want to do a matrix build on, on a number of different environments, so we just go for the standard Java stuff. You can ask for specific services to be available, databases, uh, uh, application servers, uh, all sorts of stuff. These are also pluggable things that you can kind of specify how these are installed. Uh, they get added on top of the base uh, platform by just installing normal operating system packages. Um, and you can add specific configurations to those if you want. You can add uh, custom scripts that do more and more complicated stuff uh, if you want uh, and add them uh, here in the configuration. So uh, once you have like this environment set up, uh, the, the virtual machine is, is ready uh, and all configured. Uh, then uh, Travis will take a look at the script that you want to run. That's basically the build command that, that you want tested. And that's basically, um, whatever command line command that you want to run. Uh, you could have uh, in your repository a more complicated script for running something, something complex. In our case, we just do a Maven build um, uh, with specific uh, integration testing profiles. So it's kind of a more complete build than what you do normally when, when building it locally. And uh, and then at the end, uh, we don't have any deployment options or stuff like that. Uh, if you do want to do something like that, you can see them in the configuration guide. Uh, what we do have here is, is this notification section. We actually had to disable the email notifications because they were just, just spamming the moder moderators all the time. Um, and instead, I added this, this kind of uh, gateway uh, that's running on, on my own server. Um, it's a bit ugly, but it works. And this is where you then, then configure the kind of, if you want to do, do like comments on, on GitHub uh, on those commits or, or pull requests, there's, there's uh, a specific configuration for that as well. And you can do IRC notifications or tweets or whatever you like. So, um, I think I'm, I'm, I still have a, some minutes left. Um, we could go through uh, like, like a walkthrough of, of what it looks like uh, live, if you like, or if you have some questions, then we could have that, or some, some comments on, on kind of if you're doing something similar 
uh, something a little bit different, it would be interesting to hear about that as well. It's per uh, component or kind of per virtual machine. Wow. So, Why so, did they set up yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, basically, like, like, at the moment, as far as I I know, based on, on on talking with some of the people who are running it, they do have quite a lot of capacity at the moment. So, it, it unless you do something totally unreasonable, they won't complain. Uh, but, but of course, like, as the system gets gets more and more popular. At some point, it's, it's going to start. If everyone does it, then it's not going to work. And they'll have to tr start limiting it. So um, I think they have a pretty good guideline in, the, in, in their documentation on kind of, if, if you need something like that, feel free to use it. But, but kind of only if you really do need that. So just don't configure something just for the fun that you can do it. <laughs> Only like, okay, if there is a real need that I, w I want to be testing on that obscure platform, then, then it's okay. But if, if it's just because I can, then it's better not to do it. Do you know the statuses on uh, Facebook Git support for the, the work in progress? Uh, sorry? Which, do you know the, the statuses for official you know, in-progress? Oh, yeah, the work in it's been a working progress for, for, for a while. The, the, the reason why it's that way is that kind of the, the current Git Apache org is something that, that um, I and a couple of other people built up early on for the, the SVN mirroring use case. And the work in progress uh, server was then built as a kind of by other people doing the read write Git repositories. And kind of at that time when that was built, I didn't have too much time to, to be involved, so I can kind of help in, in kind of getting those two, two systems integrated very well. So at the kind of it's still kind of they work a little bit differently, and it's it's not it, it's a bit non-trivial to, to merge them together, but it it's it's in progress, and and I would I would be surprised if they still were separate. Uh, servers by the end of this year. So there's quite a lot of stuff happening at the moment uh, with, with the pull request stuff and, uh, and, and then various other bits uh, being, being added. So I, I would expect that to be fixed uh, sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that obviously always helps, but. The source code is available. There are uh, companies that do run it internally. We actually at Adobe, we consider doing that. Um, and I think some, some teams actually did that. Um, I think at, at the time, well, I know at least some, some teams that, that do currently um, uh, buy the service from, from the Travis company. So. Then you don't have any limitations. Also, if if you, if you buy the, the the commercial service, then you get rid of those those limits, and you just have like pay by the amount of, of computing power that that you want. Um, and 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 kind of a big reason for for running it internally is that if you have some source code that you don't want to leave your network, then you want to have the the CI system internally, and that's possible to do with Travis. Just kind of since it's it's designed to run. In cloud environments, you need to have a reasonably sized system, basically a, a private cloud to do that. Yeah. 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 I guess you could. Um, I don't see why why you couldn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there there are some of these limitations to to the system, um, in addition to the download or kind of network use. Um, 
So there are some things that you can't do, um, but uh, I haven't hit any other, other limitations than the network so far, so. Any other questions? I think we're, we're about running out of time. Well, the guideline that I use personally, um, I don't think there's, there's a very strict guideline that that's written somewhere, but kind of based on, on common sense, uh, uh, what I do when I see someone kind of uh, uh, send, uh, make an issue uh, or, or kind of send a mail to, to, to the mailing list that, okay, I have these changes in my Git repository, can you pull these? Um, I basically take a look at those and figure out whether it makes sense, whether those changes would make sense as a normal standalone patch. Um, and if, if it's like a huge amount of changes all, all bundled together, then I just kind of, exactly the same thing that I would do with a normal patch, I'd say like, okay, that's too much, break it up and submit it in smaller pieces. So then we have a clearer provenance of what you're actually doing and that kind of you actually understand what's going on, which is a pretty good proxy that, that you actually wrote that code. Yeah, it's basically like if, if someone contributes something, we basically trust that they have the right to contribute that. If they don't, if it later turns out that, that actually they didn't have the right to do that, then we just pull out the code. Uh, but, but typically, like, as long as you, you kind of make sure that the contributor, if, if it's a larger patch, um, it, it's a good idea to kind of ask some questions about it to verify that, that the contributor has actually at least read through the code and understands it, and uh, and if he does that, then it's it's quite likely that that it's they actually wrote it, or at least like work with some person who wrote it, and then through that have have the right to to contribute it. Yeah, yeah. I think a key key thing there is that that like as I mentioned that, that there needs to be a record of, of something why something happened, and if you're taking code from somewhere else like not yourself or or someone you work with within the same company, so kind of it's the company that's really contributing the code, uh, you need to have some record within the ASF infrastructure that tells from the original contributor that that I want this code to be added. To Apache, so you don't just go out and okay, this looks like a nice patch out there somewhere, and I'll take it. And to, to add on to that, I think there was a case a few months ago where uh, the CLI project accepted a sample page from somebody. They asked for a sample page that's going to be reported above. It was uh, uh, submitted to the group to provide a sample page. It turned out they didn't own that sample page because the person who came back later to read it and check it and the person who owned that came back later and explained it. It was yeah. all Well, um, if the pull request comes to, to the official uh, Apache mirrors within the, the, the Apache uh, organization instead of to your own fork, uh, then it's essentially equivalent uh, to, to sending that patch to, to an Apache mailing list. Because like, it's just another way of, of submitting it, the, the code to us. We are in control of the Apache organization within, within GitHub. So, so kind of the, the, the clauses within the Apache license that like if you contribute something to, to Apache, then like by default it's under the Apache license, uh, unless you say something else. Uh, so, so if you send a pull request to the Apache organization, to a mirror there, uh, then implicitly you are, you are agreeing that, okay, making a commitment that I want to contribute this. Um, it's kind of, when you take a patch from, from, from someone else, uh, like 
when you commit it to subversion, the, the git commit metadata is, is lost. So, so the author and committer of, of the commit is not, not kept around in, in SVN. Instead of just the commit message is there. And what you want to do, do there is, is kind of, um, ideally you, you'd, you'd modify the commit message, add an information that, okay, this one was contributed by, by X, Y, um, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's also kind of a good argument of, of kind of asking the commits to come in in, in kind of a short sequences, so you don't have like like uh, someone that that sends a pull request with twenty commits in it. Uh, but rather, okay, split that in, in small pieces, one commit at a time, so we know what's going on, uh, and we can actually kind of go and treat those commits one by one and, and modify the metadata to, to, to record the stuff where it came from and, and, and why it was, was accepted. Okay, thank you. Last talk. <laughs> Hi. So how widely is Bam CI used for general analysis? It's, 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 it's very widely used, at least in, within the Ruby community. 